It's uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Fowler tonight. Uh, he's uh, he's been an, an amateur astronomer, uh, a professor. Uh, for many decades, actually, astronomy has been a passion of yours uh, going back to the 60s, I guess. Yeah, it? 1960s, yeah. Uh, that's uh, truly amazing. But, uh, you know, he's a, he's a frequent uh, reviewer on cloudy nights. He's written uh, numerous articles on the topic. Um, and I believe you've got three, three books now, three books. Yeah, three. I have another one coming out this month. So Okay. So we, we'll, we'll invite you back uh, for that. But... Uh, our talk tonight is really about how to optimize your astrophotography setup. And uh, Dr. Fowler wrote an article back uh, in earlier in the summer, I believe it was, for uh, uh, a periodical. And, uh, you know, it's it's really, I went through that article. I also saw some of his slides, and, uh, and Thomas actually helped me with one of my images. Uh, so I'm super excited to have you. Uh, and I think you you can convey an awful lot of uh, really relevant and interesting information for all of us here. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. And, and for folks that want to ask questions, I would say usually we like to kind of reserve them to the end. But in some cases, maybe it's better to keep you on track. If you, if you feel like you need to ask it, go ahead and ask it, um, because it probably pertains to the slide specifically. Uh, but you can also type it in the chat room also. So. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas Fowler, and it's over to you. Okay, thanks, everybody. I hope you find this uh, this presentation uh, interesting. I, I did a lot of work uh, to try to make uh, to learn this myself, so I like to share what I've learned. Uh, just a reminder: we have less than two and a half years for the next one. This is a shot I took at uh, in Tennessee uh, for the last eclipse. So the little dot right there, if you can see it on your screen, is Regulus. So we have to start getting ready for that. And tonight, we're going to talk about what the problem is, how, look at how your camera sees the sky. We're going to look at measures of star smearing in your images. We'll talk about the star image size, uh, the difference between long and short exposures, and a few other items. I have a spreadsheet that I, that I made up that um, I can, I'll make available to anybody who wants it. Uh, in fact, just send me an email um, at send me an email at the address here on this slide, and I'll send you a link that covers that spreadsheet, this presentation, and uh, also the article that was in Astronomy Technology Today that uh, Paul referenced. Okay, uh, this was the uh, this is the article. This was the issue here, uh, as you can see on the left, and then my article was on the right. So. Uh, uh, I'll, like I said, my link will have, uh, we'll, we'll cover that article as well. Okay. Okay. So the problem is uh, user disappointment. Uh, you spend uh, a lot of money on a nice telescope and imaging system and your images aren't what you expect. You, you, you end up with bloated stars and maybe the image, maybe the stars are dimmer than you would hope to get. So how do we analyze this situation? That's what we're going to talk about. The goals are to optimize our equipment uh, for astrophotography. We want to minimize exposure time, and we want to maximize detail. And maximizing detail means we want to optimize the pixel size relative to the noise, which comes from mount imperfections mainly and scene. We'll also look at the limits that configurations have with respect to the detail that they can obtain. Uh, and then show what to do to improve detail and, and estimate some relative exposure times. And of course, we want to overall manage expectations. Uh, what can you realistically expect to get with your imaging system? And, uh, we want, and I want to help you decide if a new piece of equipment is worth the money in terms of uh, improved imaging. So we're going to look at two cases separately. The first is short exposure, or the first we're going to look at long exposure, and then we'll talk about short exposure. Uh, short exposure, uh, the situation there is you have very little uh, or no smearing of star images, and it's mainly governed by pixel size and telescope resolution. Uh, scene conditions are still important, but they play less of a role than for long exposures, where you always will get some smearing of your star images. And that smearing is a function of pixel size, scene conditions, uh, mount performance, and the magnitude. 
Okay, so how does your camera see the sky? Well, basically the camera consists of a large array of pixels, as you know, and you have light coming in from a star that's going to impinge on these pixels. Now, ideally what you would like is you would like to have your star uh, fit on one pixel because this will minimize exposure time since all the light from the star will be hitting one pixel and it will also maximize detail because you, you will be able to use uh, every one of your pixels for uh, recording detail. Uh, this is basically not a realizable situation in most cases, but we want to get as close as we can. With long exposures, of course, what you actually get is something like this. You have that star image dancing around on your pixels uh, on account of uh, the various things that you're no doubt well aware of, including the... Uh, smearing of the star doing, doing, uh, due to scene conditions and various imperfections in your mount uh, and tracking and so forth. The result of the exposure, of the long exposure, is you get uh, a sort of a smeared out star image uh, that on your, um, on your, uh, on your uh, pixels. And that translates into uh, this kind of image. Uh, that is, you have some pixels, you have the, your, your your star, instead of being on one pixel, might be on a very large number of pixels. So what we want to do is we want to say, well, how can we analyze this and maybe what can we do about it? So we have this random walk of the star, as we saw earlier. And uh, as you, I'm sure most of you are aware, the seeing conditions are uh, give rise to random motion of stars due to atmospheric turbulence. Uh, as a phenomenon, this tends to be fairly fast. Uh, on the other hand, errors in your auto guiding system uh, due to mechanical inaccuracies in the mount, mount flexure, uh, and imperfect feedback control in the auto guiding system will also tend to smear out your image. This tends to be much slower than the, the seeing condition uh, turbulence. So how do we measure these things? Well, seeing is measured by various scales. Uh, a common one is the Antoniadi scale. Uh, and for our purposes, that's the most useful, I think. Uh, it gives the seeing conditions in terms of arc seconds. <clears throat> Errors in auto guiding systems are given by an RMS number that you read off of your auto guiding equipment or your program, such as uh, PhD. And this is also specified in arc seconds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is Antoniotti scale of seeing. And as you can see, um, you know, we have it here rated excellent, good, average, poor, and bad. Uh, and there's a verbal description. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with this one form or another. And it associates uh, what you see through the telescope with an image and with uh, a corresponding arc second uh, value. Uh, now, around this area, unless your situation is a lot different than mine, you're never going to get category five here. Once in a while, you might get category four. Most of the time, I think you're probably going to be in category three, but of course, I can't speak for everybody's conditions. But um, around here, you know, you're going to be in this area where you're going to have seeing conditions in the one to two arc second range. Um, and most nights, uh, I consider that, if I'm on the low end of that, I consider it a good night. So as this chart says, this is common at ordinary sites, which is what most of us most of us have. Best sites would be the ones like in the mountains of Chile or Canary Islands and places like that. Okay. Now for the error of your uh, equipment, uh, your auto guiding error, uh, depending on what equipment you have, uh, the view on the left is a picture I took of my um, uh, MGen3 auto guider. And that displays the um, the RMS error in uh, right ascension and declination uh, on the screen, and then uh, the right is uh, an image I did with uh, of a of a track from PhD guiding. And again, you know, you can see that um, it gives you the RA and DEC RMS values for your uh, your particular setup. So uh, you can get the information on the RMS this way, and you can get the information. Well, you have to estimate the information for the seeing conditions by looking through your scope and seeing what you 
what kind of uh, star images you get. Okay, so as we said, the seeing measures the random atmospheric motions uh, and it acts like a standard deviation of a normally distributed variable. We assume the mean value to be zero. And the RMS value reported by your auto guider, uh, like a lot of RMS values, we also assume acts like a standard deviation. And um, we're going to assume that there's no uh, drift that's assumed to be corrected by your auto guider. Uh, and the, the RMS value for the auto guider um, is what we're going to use. We're assuming the mount can't respond fast enough to track seeing. So that's where we are. By the way, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the calculations that I use here. Uh, all this is done by a spreadsheet that you can download, so you don't have to worry about cocking down any of these formulas or anything. I'm just going to give them to you for background. So basically, uh, to get the overall measure of smearing, uh, we're just going to use loss of statistics. So we're going to combine the RA and the DEC for the, uh, values for the mount in the usual way. We're going to take the RMS seeing as the arc second value on the Antoniati scale. We're going to combine that with the RMS mount to get our RMS total. And that will give us an indication of uh, the total amount of smearing that we'll get in, in, in arc seconds. Sample calculation, now again, you don't need to do this. The spreadsheet does it all, but um, you start with one second arc sec, uh, one arc second seeing conditions, maybe 0.8 arc seconds tracking, which is pretty good. Um, you can calculate the total smear you get about 1.3 arc seconds. Um, and then uh, when you know the area seen by the pixel, uh, area seen by each pixel of your telescope, of your camera telescope combination, uh, then you can calculate um, uh, uh, interesting things like how many pixels are going to be taken up by the star image. So you just need to uh, do a few calculations, including, for example, an area seen by by uh, your pixel of, of uh, each pixel of your camera. Okay. Uh, also, you need to know the star image size, which is the area disk size for your uh, for your setup. And so the total image size is the smear plus the star image size. And uh, to account for the fact this is an RMS number, that is a standard deviation, uh, we simply multiply it by a convenient number. I use 1.5, but you can change that on the spreadsheet if you like. So that would mean, for example, in this case, we would have about 3.3 arc seconds effective diameter of our smeared image. And then if you know how many uh, pixels uh, what what the uh, what the size of the area of the sky seen by each pixel is? You can calculate the number of pixels. Uh, 4.03 would actually be a very good number. It would look something like this little picture I have here. Okay, uh, that'll give you an idea of what a good image looks like. So uh, going back to what your camera sees, the pixels see. Um, if you have a good image, you would have something like, you know, I'm looking, I'm seeing on the left-hand side here. You'd very rarely get this very leftmost one here, but um, you would get something in this range, which would be good. Uh, when you get a larger star image compared to your pixels, uh, you're getting into an oversample condition. Uh, and then, you know, a bigger star image is significant oversample, and this would be really gross oversample. Now, there's nothing actually wrong with these. The problem is that you're going to greatly increase your exposure time with this kind of thing or this kind of thing simply because you're spreading the light from their star over more pixels than you absolutely have to. And also, of course, using uh, a star, which is a very small uh, thing, a point source, taking up this many pixels, you're going to reduce the resolution that you get. Now, when I talk about stars here, I talk about dim stars because, as you'll see, uh, bright stars tend to give larger images regardless of how good your imaging system is. So at any rate, the effects of smearing uh, means that you get fewer photons per pixel, which means longer exposure time. A larger area is occupied by small point sources, that is, dim stars, so you get less detail captured. So the takeaway is you want to match as much as you can pixel size with your scope for optimum results. Now, obviously, most of us don't have the luxury of having many, many cameras with different pixel sizes, and we may be in many, many scopes. So 
you just do the best you can. The spreadsheet calculates for you um, uh, how many pixels are likely to be used by your setup. And so you, on that basis, you can decide whether you want to increase your focal length or uh, decrease it with a focal reducer or something like that. Like I said, the spreadsheet does all the necessary calculations. Um, and uh, I left all my information in the spreadsheet. So all you got to do is basically plug in your information, which consists of the aperture of your scope, focal ratio, camera pixel size, number of pixels in your camera, the power of any Barlow or reducer lens you're using, and the size of any object you want to image. So if you plug that stuff in, the spreadsheet will do the calculations for you. Now, this is what a good exposure looks like. Um, and um, what you can see here is the dim stars take up just a very small number of pixels with a bright center. Brighter stars uh, uh, look larger. Now, uh, that's always going to happen. The brighter the star, uh, the, the more pixels it's going to take up. You can't, you can't fix that. That's just the nature of, um, of, the, of the processes involved in recording images. And in fact, um, your eye actually does the same thing. Um, and if you don't believe me, just go out tonight after the meeting and look at a bright star and then look at a dim star and the bright star will look, bright, lo will look larger in your eye. Okay, well, at any rate, to get the maximum detail and minimum exposure time, of course, you need to adjust your mount for best performance, which means alignment and tracking. Uh, and then you want to estimate the total uh, RMS error for your setup and including, of course, scene conditions. And then insofar as you can, choose the optimum pixel size. Uh, ideally, 1.5 times total RMS should be less than or equal to sky dimension seen uh, by, uh, by a pixel. Okay. And that minimizes the number of pixels exposed for a dim star, and this will give you the maximum detail. In general, as a general rule, and this is only a general rule, uh, cameras with larger pixel size and larger numbers of pixels will tend to give the best results unless you have very good scene conditions and a very good mount. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, let me just say a little bit about star sizes and, and what happens to them when you take images. Um, I've been talking about dim stars because image size grows as, uh, as you expose longer. Uh, we think of stars as points of light, but as I mentioned, they really aren't. The star image size uh, on the sensor depends on its magnitude, the exposure time, focal ratio, and the objective diameter. And this is also true, like I said, for the eye. Bright stars look larger. Uh, even, and like planets look larger, even though actually your eye can't resolve the diameters of them. Uh, so we're going to um, we're going to talk about detail uh, in terms of what you can do, the best you can do, which would be the size of the dimmest stars. I have more details in my book about image sizes for stars. Uh, if you want to look that up, or I can give you send you information about it. Um, this is a graph right here of the image size for Vega. Now, I took this with a 11-inch SCT at, S, at F7. Um, and you can see what happens as the exposure time goes up, the star image size uh, in microns on the, on the uh, sensor uh, goes up, uh, ex goes up uh, very quickly. There's a formula that you can use. It's in my book to calculate the star image size. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but let me just point out that the star image size goes up as the square root of your diameter. It goes up directly in proportion to your focal length, which means shorter focal lengths will give smaller image sizes for stars. Uh, and then the, it also goes up as a function of the exposure time, the fourth root of the exposure time. And that's divided by uh, the magnitude to the 1.25 power. So um, this gives you an idea of how the star sizes increase. Uh, bright stars can get large very fast. This is about a, I don't think it's about a 10 second image I took of Vega. So you can see how many pixels are involved here. So you have to be aware of that when you're doing your imaging. Uh, so like I said, star size depends on magnitude. If you look at this image that I took uh, of the M52 in the bubble nebula region, 
uh, this is this is of course right in the Milky Way area, so that's why we have so many stars. This is a broadband image, which means it's the total spectrum, a visible spectrum. Uh, this is M52 down here. This is the bubble nebula up here. There's the bubble right there, if you can see it on your screen. Uh, but what I want you to notice is notice how notice the the background Milky Way stars are very very tiny. Uh, and if you download the slides, you can probably see this better. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, some of the foreground stars you can see are, are fairly large, okay? So uh, this would be typical of what happens when you do uh, exposures. Your, your dim stars are going to come out very tiny, and your, your, your brighter stars are going to look uh, much larger. And here's another image, same kind of thing. Again, this is a broadband image, and uh, you get a lot of stars, but you can see the heart nebula here comes out, but again, you can see the stars, uh, the brighter stars show much larger in this, uh, in this image. Uh, these images, by the way, are about 20 minute exposures at a dark sky site. Um, that's a setup that I use. It's 115 millimeter uh, uh, telescope with an Elzos lens and a Canon 6D, modified Canon 6D. So that's on a Las Mandy G11 with the MGen3 auto guider that you can see. It's a tiny little thing here that allows you to operate in the field without having to have a computer. Actually, the MGen will actually control a DSLR, so you don't even need a computer at all if you want to go out in the field and, and, and get away without a computer. Okay, uh, to maximize detail, uh, obviously the larger your smeared image is, the fewer... Uh, details you're going to be able to record. So to quantify that, I define uh, what I call an area resolution unit, which is the smallest area in pixels your setup can give. So if you're getting something like this, you're going to be able to record a lot of details because you can put that in a lot of different places on your sensor. If you're, if you, the best you can do in terms of detail is something like the right hand side here. Uh, then you're not going to be able to record as many details. And again, the spreadsheet calculates this, but the calculations that I do involve you to, you have to, you have to decide how, or you have to tell the spreadsheet the area of the object you want to image, basically the RA index sizes. Um, and then the spreadsheet will convert that to pixels, and then that'll divide, that, uh, and then that'll basically calculate for you the uh, your uh, area are you, and then you divide the total pixels by that to give to give an idea of how many details you're going to be able to record. For example, if if you have uh, 34,000 ARUs available on your sensor, and, and each each one is five uh, pixels, then you're going to be able to get 6,000 uh, 6,850. There shouldn't be a K after that. Um, uh, the details. Okay, well, again, the spreadsheet calculates that for you. Uh, here's an example. Uh, again, this was taken with that same equipment about the same exposure. Uh, this is M33. Uh, for the actual image of M33 itself, there's about 2.38 million pixels. Uh, and at the size of the resolution I was getting here, that turned into about 300,000 uh, resolution units. So this image is, is fairly detailed. Uh, this is cropped somewhat from the original uh, image that I took, but you can you can see it came out fairly well. This is a blow up of it, and then you can see dim areas in the image. You can see I wasn't getting uh, like one or two or five pixels. They're they're a little bit bigger. Okay, so um, a little bit of a little bit of smearing, a uh, little bit of smearing there. The effect of having too few resolution units, that is your, 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 uh, your imaging system is making uh, uh, sizes of images that are too big, uh, you might get something like that. And then, of course, your image is going to end up looking like this, which is, uh, well, maybe OK for some purposes, but hopefully you can do better. Uh, now, in terms of uh, parameters you can control, I did a little bit of work to try to, this is not in the article, but I did a little bit of research to try to figure out how mounting, how mount performance varies as a function of weight. Now, this is, I, I, I couldn't really get a lot of information, but I, I got the information that I could and just draw, drew a line through it. 
And you can see that in terms of RMS tracking, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the mount tracking performance is a function of weight. Now, this I don't think anybody's going to be surprised about that. Um, and then, of course, as your mount gets heavier, uh, you, you tend to get better, better tracking performance. So, uh, you know, bigger, heavier mounts do, do tend to work better. As a function of money, as dollars, it, you, probably not surprising there. Again, your, your tracking performance gets better as your mount cost uh, increases. So if you have uh, a really expensive mount, uh, an astrophysics or a 10 micron or one of those in the $10,000 range, uh, you, you're going to get better performance than if you have a, a $1,000 mount or something. So, you know, just a rough guide there for, for that. Uh, however, it turns out that at most sites, a mount, uh, seeing dominates mount performance. So, uh, for example, uh, in this graph here with seeing set at 1.5, um, you don't, you get some improvement going from 0.5 to 1.5 in terms of RMS mount performance, but you don't get a huge amount. So uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't buy an expensive mount, but just be aware that seeing conditions are going to swamp a lot of the gain you get from laying out the 10 grand for that astrophysics mount. So, uh, and then, but mount performance does dominate aperture in terms of smearing. So uh, you do get it a, you do get a significant improvement uh, with with better mounts uh, in, in, as compared to, to uh, more aperture on your scope. Let me give you an example of the fact that you're going to get a limitation uh, if uh, depending on your, your your overall setup. This is an image that I took of Markarian's chain uh, here, and um, I want to zero in on this little. Uh, galaxy right here that I have circled. Um, and if you look at that, you can see the the effect of resolution limits uh, on this image. Uh, that galaxy, it's NGC 4440. It has a size of roughly 70. It's a barred spiral, as you can see. It has a size of about 100 by 70 arc seconds. Um, but you can see that my system, you know, I've hit a resolution limit here. You can see the, the pixelation of the image. Uh, on the right-hand side, this is a blow-up from uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep field. Now, this galaxy is, of course, much smaller than what I can record. It's 1.5 arc seconds in diameter. Uh, but you can see the pixelation here in the Hubble image. So no matter what system you have, at some point you're going to hit objects where you're going to run into a resolution limit. So, um, you know, you just have to be aware of what, what you can, what you can actually do. I don't think this is a surprise to anybody in this audience, but I just thought I'd show this. Uh, so the impact of the factors at most sites for the purpose of minimizing smear, uh, seeing is going to be more important than mount performance, and that's going to be more important than aperture. Uh, but for minimizing exposure time, uh, aperture is generally going to be larger than seeing and um, mount performance. Now let's take a look, quick look at short exposures. Um, in short exposures, you don't have so much smearing due to seeing conditions. Uh, so mainly the details of function of aperture. Uh, seeing conditions to some degree, uh, short exposures that you generally use uh, when doing things like the moon and planets, uh, reduce but do not completely eliminate the smearing associated with uh, poor seeing. Uh, really, really good images still require good seeing, and I'll show you some that are extremely good. Um, so you have to keep keep that in mind. I think most people are aware that you know aperture does rule for some some purposes. Uh, I should also say that in addition to aperture, of course, the optical quality of your setup is important. If you have poor optics, then, you know, op aperture isn't going to help much. Okay, so let me talk for a minute about function of aperture. We're going to look at it, two images here, both taking with extremely high quality telescopes, okay? Uh, the one on the right was, was 140 millimeter tech APO, and the one on the left is with a 350 millimeter CFF Cassegrain. Now, the one on the right 
is a very, very good image of Jupiter, as anybody who's tried to do this can tell you. Okay, that's very, very good detail for that. Uh, for 140 millimeter, it's quite good. But you can see that with a 350 millimeter, um, you know, you can do better. So aperture does rule in terms of, of getting very, very fine detail. These are both very good images. Now, just to show you, though, how far we've come, okay, um, if you look at images taken by the 36-inch uh, Lake Observatory refractor, there's a picture of it. You can see how gigantic that thing is. Because uh, you can see the little, you can see the observer's uh, little uh, platform here. Uh, the observer would be barely visible on this picture, um, and you see, of course, how big the the, the dome is for this thing. Uh, in the 19th century, this was the best picture they could get of Jupiter with that. Okay, so the digital imaging has allowed us to come an awfully long, awfully long way in terms of uh, in terms of quality. Of course, the Lick refractor was uh, an acromat and uh, given the size and so forth, uh, the color correction wasn't very good. But if you're just taking black and white images with filters, hey, it's, it's a, it was okay. At any rate, this gives you an idea that was done with a 36 inch refractor. And now we're doing the one on the right here with 140 millimeter or about a, a five and a half inch refractor. Okay, uh, the resolution that's possible with a large image, I don't know how detailed you can see this on your screen, but if you download the slides, you can see it. This is really amazingly detailed. This was taken with that same 350 millimeter CFF uh, Cassegrain. Uh, this is really an amazing picture. It almost looks like it was taken by a satellite uh, right over top of the moon. So aperture is important. Okay, like I said, I have a spreadsheet that will automate all these calculations for you if you want to do them. Uh, the instructions are on the first page for using it, and you just need to enter the relevant information about your scope and camera and size of the object you wish to image. And the link that I have also contains the uh, Astronomy Technology Today article. Uh, let me just put in a plug here for Astronomy Technology Today magazine. Um, it's really got a lot of useful information in it. And it comes out like three or four times a year, and it has uh, mostly concentrates on uh, the newest technology. Now, having said that, I don't want anybody coming back to me in a year and telling me that uh, I caused you to bust your entire budget because you saw all this neat equipment in this magazine. Because uh, uh, when you read the stuff, when you read that magazine, you're going to want to buy a lot of the stuff they have in there. I can tell you. But anyway, it's still a good magazine. I, I recommend it. Uh, I don't remember what the subscription cost is. It's not very much. So, um, so I just put a plug in for them. Uh, just an excerpt, a few excerpts from the spreadsheet. It's too big to show on the screen here. So. Uh, but I cut off, I cut a few images out. So you have to enter in the spreadsheet uh, your RMS tracking error and the scene conditions. And then you have to enter information about the object you're trying to image roughly, you know, what size it is horizontal, what size it is vertical. And the spreadsheet will calculate, you enter that in arc minutes and the spreadsheet will calculate that in arc seconds for you. And then um, this is where you enter your scope information. So I put my scope here. Lens one means no, no, no extra lens. 7.75 means a focal reducer. 1.5 means a Barlow. Uh, so anything less than one means a focal reducer and anything greater than one means a Barlow. You put in your aperture, you put in your focal ratio and the spreadsheet will calculate your focal length. And then it'll also calculate um, the star image diameter, that is the airy disk size. Then you put in the information about your camera, um, the pixel size and the number of pixels. And then the spreadsheet will calculate the rest of the stuff for you. And it'll calculate um, the area resolution units that you get with the conditions. Um, and then uh, whether you're getting sampling or not, how good your sampling is, the kind of detail you're probably going to get in your image. Okay. And it'll tell you the exposure time relative to the, the best that you get for your scope. Um, and then some for short exposures, it'll calculate this, basically the, the area resolution units and uh, how many pixels you're liable to be getting um, for your detail. Uh, and then um, 
and then uh, whether you're getting what kind of sampling you're getting, what kind of detail or quality you're likely to get. So uh, that's basically what the spreadsheet calculates. So that's basically it. So quick overview. And like I said, um, let me go back to the beginning here. And you, if you need that link um, uh, the, to my email, uh, just send that to me and I'll send you the if you have my email address here. I'll send you my um, I'll send you a link to the uh, folder that has um, has uh, all the um, as the article has this this presentation, the original article and the spreadsheet in it. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Thomas. This is great. Um, I think the value here is really going to be that the the spreadsheet and actually kind of going back through your slide deck. Can you? If you want to send me a, the materials you'd like me to push out to membership, that would probably be the easiest. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link, Paul, because the the briefing is kind of big, and right. you probably can't mail it out. But I'll send you the link, and anybody can go there and get it. So. Okay, and we'll find a way to share the slides to uh, some way. Yeah, the link the link has the slides and the article and the spreadsheet. So. Okay. They, they get the if you go to that link, you get everything. So. Okay, cool. Um, Alan, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. Very good sure. presentation. And I did look at the article. It was very interesting when it came out in mm -hmm. uh, in technology. Um, on on your on your equation for the growth of star sizes. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that's empirical, and it's not taking into consideration any pixel to pixel bleeding. No, it's not. You're right. It is. It is empirical. And I mean, insofar as there's pixel bleeding, I mean, it, it, it might have shown up in the empirical thing. What I did there was I did a lot of tests and I just basically did some curve fitting to make it work. And, and so that's how I came up with that formula. You're right. The pixel bleeding is is can be a problem. Again, that's a function of the kind of sensor that you're using. And so it's hard to, to take that into account. Um, right. But you're right. You're absolutely right. That's very and, and, and what I was wondering, have you experimented with, um, uh, well, because because it's empirical, it's it's effectively the radius at which the brightness of the um, overall smeared star image exceeds background and becomes yeah. detectable. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, if you take a lot of short exposures, relatively short exposures for, for uh, faint fuzzies, Mm -hmm. It will effectively go down, I would think. Uh, it wouldn't yeah. go fast because the superposition wouldn't make them wider. That's right. That would be correct. Yes. I haven't, you're right. You're, I'm pretty sure you're right about that, Alan. I haven't actually done that experiment, but I'm pretty sure you're right about that. This was just for a single exposure, that formula. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, so right. Mm -hmm. and, and when you talked about the short exposures on planetaries, what mm -hmm. are you defining as short? Uh, uh, 10 well, hundred milliseconds? I'm thinking, you know, in, in the yeah, in the millise hundred millisecond range. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to depend on your equipment. I mean, if you're working with a real long focal length, <clears throat> excuse me, then obviously you got to have a shorter exposure, or else you are going to get uh, smearing effects. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to depend on that. But I'm thinking, you know, sub one second for sure, probably sub five hundred millisecond, two hundred. I mean, it just depends. That's actually one advantage larger scopes have is that you know, the moon or the planets are brighter and you can cut the exposure time down and reduce this, the, uh, the seeing condition smearing even more. So uh, I noticed with mine, I mean, I, I try to do what you can do with small scopes. So I noticed that, you know, 115 millimeters is, it's good, but you know, the image is dimmer in 115 millimeter than it would be in a 200 or a 250 millimeter. So, uh, you know, I have to use longer exposures. Um, where I am, the scene conditions are always pretty lousy, so that limits what I can do. I didn't show you any of my images of, of the moon because they're not nearly as good as the one I showed you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? Hey, St Stacy. Stacy. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Eric. Oh, <laughs> I'm using, oh, Eric. using my wife's computer. Sorry. <laughs> Sneaky. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for those, you know, uh, most common now people use the CMOS cameras, which are um, yeah. have fairly small pixel sizes. And for, you know, when you work with SETs with long focal lengths, 
So you're always going to be with, uh, you know, sort of oversampled, but you can bend. Uh, you didn't mention that to sort of get around that problem. Uh, well, yeah, you can bend, but when you bend, of course, you reduce the number of pixels you have available effectively or number of re what I call resolution units available. So you'll, you'll lose detail when you do that. But that's fine. Yeah, you can do that. Now, if you have a lot of pixels, maybe you don't care, you know. Right, because a lot of the cameras now are huge, so. I know. So that's actually why I prefer the the uh, the, the Canon that I use, just because the pixel sizes are large. I had a QHY camera that had even larger pixel sizes. I think they were 7.8 microns, uh, which actually made it nice to do imaging because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you got the big pixel size, a lot of pixels, and they were big, and uh but of course, the other the down the other issue, as you as you said with the SCTs, not all of them will cover large sensors, so you're going to be limited in terms of how large an image that the SCT will allow you to 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 do. I have an eight inch SCT, but that will not cover anything close to a full frame right. uh, sensor. So, you know, that's again a trade off you know you got to make. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Stacy. Hey, Chris, got a question? Well, yeah, and actually, it's kind of the uh, the bookend to uh, to, to Eric's there. Um, the uh, you know, Dr. Fowler, when you showed the image from the Hubble, yeah, uh, in, in the deep field, yeah. Any sense? Well, do do you know was that drizzled that image? Because I know for a lot of the stuff that Hubble does that they publish, they tend to drizzle their images so that they can, you know, extract more detail out of their larger pixel size. And, uh, and, that's, you know, that, yeah. So that, I, I, that's another factor. Yeah, I think. Right. That's that's a good question. That's really a good question, Chris. I honestly don't know that. I just took it from the, the uh, I just took it from the Hubble Deep Field image that they publish. So you may well be right. And, 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 and I guess, uh, you know, that I don't know what effect that would have on, uh, on um, amateurs, I haven't used that technique. Maybe have you? Yeah, I do not either. Honestly, yeah. I don't. I've never. Well, you yeah. talk about bad conditions. I'm right smack in the middle of Arlington, so there's you know, I'm 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 glad to get anything on the sensor. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, I go yeah. out to West Virginia when I want to do serious imaging because. Uh, I'm right near Georgetown, so oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. But I guess you know the point, or my 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 point would be that if if that Hubble image was was in fact drizzled, then you're probably not comparing apples to apples. Probably not, no. But yeah. even even drizzled, you could see there were there was a pixel limitation there that that you know they can only get so much resolution with that scope. Absolutely, absolutely. So so everybody ultimately has to face that. But you yeah, know, there's. Yes, um, Chris, the, um, if it was taken with, I don't remember, but if the ultra deep field was taken with whiff pick one, then it was designed to be just about optimally map matched to the diffraction okay. limit. And there wouldn't have been much of an advantage in drizzling. They would have okay. applied uh, special processing to improve it a little, but there's not much they could do. It was. Uh, I don't know. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. You know, when you when you're spending ten million dollars for the CCD chip, you get mm -hmm. to match it to the optical system. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And Michael, uh, Michael Brook in the comments just said, just asked, okay, what's a drizzle? Um, Alan, Tom, do you guys do when you guys want to take a crack at it, or somebody else want to take a crack at it? I'll leave this to somebody who knows more about it than I do. Alan, do you are you familiar with it? Hey, Linda, go for it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I was going to say it's a super resolution technique where if you um, have different centroids to the pixels and you and especially if you know a priori that you're looking at point sources or point like sources, you can use mathematical techniques to improve the effective resolution beyond what beyond the, the physical size of the pixels. Okay. Uh, one technique that I use, um, I, I, I don't know the mathematics. I haven't been able to find anybody who's done the mathematics on this, 
is um, uh, the sh very sharpening techniques that are available in uh, in in different image processing programs. Uh, some of those uh, might be able to improve resolution uh, beyond what the what the um, what the DAW's limit is, but I'm not I'm not positive about that. It's something I want to look into. Maybe some of you people are more familiar with that. I like to use deconvolution, but um, but I don't know if that allows you to exceed uh, DAW's limit or not uh, in terms of resolution. Let's go to Linda. Linda, do you have a comment on on this? Or you probably have drizzled. I know it's an option you can use. And I, I've experimented with it with my eighty millimeter scope. It's most useful when you have undersampled data. There, if you're well sampled or oversampled, there's no practical use for it. Um, actually, that's not strictly true, but it won't help for resolution. Um, but um, I was going to make two other comments. One was. When we were talking about Hubble comparisons, there's a, a gentleman on Astrobin named Gary Im, uh, I M M, and he does a lot of comparisons between his images and uh, when he was working on a lot of the ARP catalog, the, the Palomar plates that ARP used and Hubble comparisons. So if you search for him on Astrobin, again, his name was Gary Im, you can see a lot of those comparisons, and they're really useful to see just how good amateur equipment can be, even though you still can't quite compete with Hubble. And then the other thing is, um, I've been seeing a lot of discussion lately about people uh, with big scopes, you know, 24 inch and 20, 20 inch and up scopes, um, actually saying that they've been seeing some benefit to actually being what we would consider really oversampled, like, you know, around 0.2 to 0.3 arc seconds per pixel and seeing some effective benefit to it. Now, I don't have any firsthand experience with it, but, um, you know, and they're using these scopes in places like uh, Sierra Remote Observatories or Chile, where the seeing is a lot better than here. But in theory, at least, they, they seem to be getting some benefit out of it with these big scopes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thomas, did you have? Um, I know. I know people want to link to the presentation. I, I'm not. I don't believe I have your slides. Um, right? You didn't send a link in the. Uh, I at one point I did send you a link, Paul, but I'll send another one out uh, it, to, right after this presentation, right after the meeting tonight. Okay, to the slides. I know I have the article, but the slide yep. deck you have, also have posted yep. somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and I don't know if you want to, if you can maybe find it you could paste it in the chat box too or else i can send it send it out either, it's, either way. yeah it's kind of a long thing uh yeah I'll, I'll send it to you right after the meeting and then okay send it out yeah on your spreadsheet i know uh, there was one variable in there that was related to scene and i think you had a number there was that what you think we should use in this area uh you know that's the number you have to figure out for yours i i um I, that that was the number I I used when I was doing that, doing that calculation. Let me go back to it. Uh, 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 yeah, it was in the spreadsheet table you had. Yeah, there is uh, one point eight. I mean, you, you might do better than that. I mean, you can get conditions. I think around here in this general area, is you know, down towards one but it's going to depend on where you are. And I've also found that it depends a lot on whether I'm looking straight up through very little atmosphere or whether I'm shooting out towards uh, more closer to a horizon where I'm shooting through a lot more atmosphere. I get a lot, I get a lot poor seeing conditions when I'm trying to shoot below about 30 or 40 degrees above the horizon. Over Straight overhead, I definitely get much better or nearly overhead, I get much better seeing conditions, uh, much better lower arc seconds. Uh, that's just where I am, which is near Georgetown. I'm shooting through city air here, so you may get better results where you are. I, I would say around here, somewhere between one and two on a good night. Okay. And I guess, and one other question I had just uh, from, from my kind of dabbling in this and maybe Linda can can help too but if you have like 
a variety of subs that you've taken and some show those faint stars to be well, you know, pixel, you know, a nice tight. Yeah. And some don't for whatever reason, seeing got bad or maybe your mm -hmm. tracking wasn't so good. Or, I mean, you, you could be at the point where you throw most of them away and end up with nothing, or should you integrate as many as you can? You know, is there kind of a trade-off there? Yeah, it's a trade-off. I mean, obviously, the, the more images you have, the, the fainter the things are that you're going to be able to see. I I throw away the ones that are that are really bad, and then I just generally just put the all, the rest of them in. And um, it, it, the one nice thing about the digital image processing is you can experiment and you know do it several times with different numbers of them and see what difference it makes. Um, you know, you, if you get one that has really bad tracking or something, you definitely want to throw that out, but the others are probably going to vary a little bit. Okay. Just use them all. Any other questions from folks? I know we have a lot of imagers on here and I've had emails and we've had chats looking for the, uh, spreadsheet and the, uh, in the slide. So there's a lot of, a lot of interest. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. I hope this helps. And um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send me an email. I'd be glad yeah. to yeah. help. It's all super interesting and it's so relevant to what a lot of folks do here uh, in the club. So, uh, you know, thank you, Thomas, for, for writing the article and, and putting the spreadsheet together, you know, that will uh, we'll get to folks uh, um, uh, as soon as we possibly can. And uh, that'll help. Um, okay. So appreciate okay. it very much.